Everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Testing, Tracing and Targeted Monitoring, Dealing with Employee Privacy Issues in the New World. I am David Lorimer, a Director in the Employment, Pensions, Immigration and Compliance, or EPIC team, and I'm joined by Rachel Rigg, who's a solicitor in the team EPIC. We both have a particular interest in and often advise on issues which cross over the worlds of employment and data protection law. This session is the fifth in a series of 12 webinars hosted by the Field Fisher EPIC team. We'll be hosting a 30 minute session every Tuesday at 1 p.m. covering various hot topics. We do have a lot to cover in today's session, but we're hoping to answer some of your questions at the end. If you do have any questions about today's topic, please use the question box in your control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you've used the click through link to join. If we don't manage to get to your question by 1.30 p.m., we'll seek to follow up. All of our sessions are available on our website and our YouTube channel. I'm now going to hand over to Rachel to take you through what we'll be covering today. Hi, everyone. So in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, employers are having to adapt workplace practices in order to accommodate new challenges. The first of these that we'll address today is testing and what you need to know about the legal implications around coronavirus testing in the workplace. We'll then go on to tracing, which is identifying individuals who present a transmission risk in order to prevent further spread of the virus. We're also going to talk about the use of targeted monitoring, particularly as a method to address the increased cyber threat during the pandemic, while many employees are now working from home. For each of these areas, we'll provide an overview of the legal implications and the practical takeaways for employers to assess before using these tools. The common theme to those we'll discuss today is that they all involve tricky decisions when it comes to both employment and data protection law. They often involve employers processing special category data in the form of health data in order to make significant decisions, such as relating to an employee's place of work, whether they can or should return to the workplace, or pay arrangements, whether employees are to be paid in full or at a lower rate of sick pay for periods spent self-isolating. This is all at a time of particular mental and physical strain for many. So we'll try and help you navigate these issues as best we can by showing the key points to consider and some of what we're seeing in practice. So, testing. Employers have a duty to ensure the health, safety and well-being of their staff. Employers must also handle personal data lawfully, fairly and transparently, and they're subject to particular restrictions when it comes to collecting, using and storing health and other special category data. With that potential tension in mind, many employers are considering the potential use of COVID-19 testing to ensure worker safety and to minimise the threat of a breakout affecting their workforce following a return or partial return to the workplace. So what types of tests are available? First, there's the have you got it test, which the NHS describes as the antigen test. This typically involves a swab of the nose or the back of the throat. This may need to be carried out by a medical professional, but we're seeing the introduction and increased availability of self-administered tests, including ones you can carry out at home. Employers making use of antigen tests would, in theory, be able to identify individuals who have coronavirus, subject to delays in results, which can take anything from 12 hours to three days to come back, and reliability, which can vary significantly. In theory, this type of testing may identify asymptomatic carriers, and a recent report has found this could be anywhere between 5 and 80% of cases. Secondly, there's the have you had it test, which is the antibody test. This involves a blood test and generally must be carried out by a medical professional, although home finger prick tests are commercially available. The last test we'll be discussing is the have you got symptoms test. This is temperature testing to screen staff on entry to work. It's normally conducted by use of thermal imaging cameras or scanners, handheld temperature reading devices, or by administering a thermometer. It's important to be clear early on, temperatures are a common symptom for a multitude of medical reasons and not a decisive diagnosis of coronavirus. Temperature testing may not be much more effective than relying on staff to self-diagnose symptoms and will generally identify asymptomatic carriers, but not asymptomatic carriers of the virus. 
So where tests must be administered by a qualified health professional, this may involve outsourcing to an occupational health service or using the existing providers or in-house functions if you have these you must ensure to have the appropriate paperwork in place for you and for the third party processing of health data. David will cover this in a little bit more detail. Comparatively, carrying out temperature checks may be less onerous. Manual readings may not trigger data protection obligations unless this data is recorded and processed. Interestingly, data protection authorities in both Germany and France appear to have confirmed this in principle lately, at least as it applies in their own territories. You do not need a medical professional to carry out temperature checks, but bear in mind that those administering tests could themselves be at high risk of contracting COVID-19. David, over to you for the impact. Thank, thanks, Rachel. So can employers require employees to take a test? The million dollar question in this space. The simple answer is no. If an employee refuses and you seek to administer a medical procedure, especially an antibody or antigen test, it would amount to common assault. Some employers might consider instructing employees to undergo testing with the threat of disciplinary sanctions if they fail to do that. This is problematic from an employment law perspective as it risks undermining the trust and confidence which must exist between an employer and an employee and could amount to an unreasonable management instruction, which in turn could tee up uh, an employee to resign and claim they've been constructively unfairly dismissed. However, making testing completely voluntary and consent-based can also carry risks. Employee consent should not be relied on as the relevant basis for processing health data under the General Data Protection Regulation, which requires a lawful basis for each act of processing. The inherent imbalance of power means that consent will likely be invalid. There are also some extra conditions around consent which make it a generally unattractive basis for employers. Employers may then need to rely on an alternative basis under GDPR, likely that testing is necessary to comply with their obligations to ensure the health and safety at work of their staff, or even it being necessary in the public interest to help manage the pandemic. The necessity of the measure might be called into question, of course, if the testing is genuinely and entirely voluntary. In reality, much will depend on the employers and employees' circumstances, which we'll look at in more detail in a moment. On to employer enforceability then, what can you do if someone tests positive? If an antigen test returns a positive result, the employee should self-isolate in accordance with government guidance. If they have a feverish temperature, i.e. one of over 37 and a half degrees, they should also self-isolate for at least seven days or until they test negative. In each case, they should seek a test through the NHS and be advised to confirm the outcome. Employees can work during any period of time spent self-isolating if they're able to work from home and are healthy enough, of course. Otherwise, they'll be entitled to statutory sick pay in the UK or SSP and very likely any enhanced contractual sick pay operated by the employer. Great care must be taken to safeguard the privacy of the person tested. That means the testing environment must be private. They must not be shamed, for instance, by walking past a queue of colleagues on the way out. And appropriate procedures must be in place to ensure that if they're in the workplace, Confirmation of test results and transport home is handled delicately, but in a way that minimizes exposure to others. So moving on then to practical takeaways. These are issues to consider before implementing testing, and I should stress that strongly. Firstly, one of the key points to consider from both an employment and data protection perspective will be to think about whether other less invasive measures might be implemented to safeguard employees' health and safety in the workplace. Public health guidance in the UK, or at least England, does not require employers to test their workforce. Instead, as a starting point, employers should rely on employees' self-reporting symptoms and also be looking at recommendations for COVID-secure workplaces, including reducing risk in the workplace by, for instance, reducing capacity, implementing two-metre distancing where possible, reducing the use of um, shared spaces by closing meeting rooms, limiting the number of people in lifts, etc., alongside rigorous cleaning, hand washing and hygiene procedures. There are other measures which aren't necessarily captured in the recommend 
or recommended in the guidance, but which will also be less invasive than testing. For instance, the provision of face coverings for use in commuting, implementation of one-way systems in workplaces and delivery of food to workspaces to avoid unnecessary contact in canteens. In cases where those measures have been considered, risk assessed and implemented, and in view of the fact that public health guidance doesn't mandate the use of testing, employees or data protection authorities might challenge the necessity of testing procedures, and so employers should consider how much they add to the picture. Secondly, before relying on any kind of testing, employers must consider how reliable it might be. For instance, an obvious drawback of antibody testing is that there's no consensus about how it might be used, other than as an indicator that someone has had COVID-19. To rely on antibody testing as demonstrating immunity at this stage would be dangerous. More generally, some antigen and antibody tests on the market carry significant false positive or false negative risks. Obviously, to use invasive testing only to allow people into the workplace who may be asymptomatic carriers would defeat the purpose. And finally, temperature tests have limitations too. A feverish temperature could simply uh, be triggered by a common cold, a migraine, a rigorous commute, or any other types of circumstances. I flag that you should consider employees and representatives' views where possible. If there is an existing employee forum which is being consulted with on the plans and risk assessments for the reopening of offices generally, it would be sensible to use that to canvas the position of employee reps on testing. Strong resistance would of course mean that the practical risks of challenges emerging are greater. Industry approach. Obviously, there will be variances depending on the specific place of work and in industry sector. For what it's worth, by far the most common approach we're seeing is handheld temperature devices. The benefits are that this is the least invasive and tends to minimise the amount of data collected. The UK's Data Protection Authority, the Information Commissioner, has expressly recognised that temperature testing may legitimately be carried out in some UK workplaces. And that's in contrast to the approach of some other data protection authorities in other parts of Europe. Of course, employers need to carefully consider their own unique circumstances. The final thing I've flagged is accountability and transparency. You must ensure that the appropriate data protection documentation is in place, and that will typically include a privacy notice provided to those being tested, a separate and appropriate policy document setting out the way you deal with special category data, a data protection impact assessment, which considers the impact of testing activities on subjects, uh, compliance with the relevant principles and the steps to eliminate or mitigate risks, and data processing agreements with appropriate terms in place with any third parties involved, like testing or health providers. It'll also be really important to secure any records relating to testing and ensure they're kept for only as long as is absolutely necessary. I'm now going to hand back to Rachel, who's going to give us an overview of how and why tracing might be relevant to employers. Thanks, David. So tracing is the act of identifying people who have the virus and retracing their steps to identify and notify people who may have been put at risk through close contact with the infected person. There are two main means of tracing. Apps such as the NHS Test and Trace app or the Apple and Google equivalent. These are high tech apps relying on individuals uploading their positive test results. The app then notifies others who would have been exposed who are identified through a handshake between proximate devices, which is found through Bluetooth technology. Then there's manual tracing. This is where people confirm a coronavirus diagnosis and name the individuals that have been in sufficiently close contact. Individuals can then be notified that they are at risk and must self-isolate accordingly. The apps aren't really designed to collect and present data in a way to identify individuals, so it's extremely unlikely that employers would be able to access and use this technology for their own purposes. However, particularly large employers who might want to implement their own app will need to comply with data protection law in doing so, and we've seen this suggested by some large employers in the market like PwC. How do you tell other employees if they're at risk? Well, the ICOs covered this in their guidance to data protection and coronavirus, which is available on their website. Employers can share that a colleague has a positive test result or potential exposure to COVID-19, but should avoid naming individuals if possible. If it's not possible, the ICO warns that employers must still take steps to protect the privacy of the employee in question. David, over to you for impact. 
Great, so I'm going to combine the last two questions. What action can employers take when risk has been identified and what do they get paid? Individuals identified for the government as at risk through their track and trace methodology are required to stay home for 14 days. If they can meaningfully work from home, then they can and should do so and should obviously be paid in full for that. If they cannot, they will be eligible for SSP in the UK under the government's amended criteria. That may well also make them eligible for more generous company sick pay provided unless you use different criteria. For individuals identified as at risk due to workplace tracing, the best practical advice is to try and mirror the arrangements that, that kick in when the government test and trace methodology is used. However, it's worth noting that the current SSP eligibility criteria would not necessarily capture this group. And consequently, in terms of pay for this group, the safest approach might be to continue to pay them in full if they're self-isolating uh, and unable to continue to work from home. Back to you, Rachel. So in summary, the takeaways for tracing, employer manual tracing is encouraged and it's likely to be really effective. It's a reasonable step to ask employees to disclose when they have been identified as at risk by government manual tracing or by the government app if they've installed it. But bear in mind, there's little to no ability to check this. We'd generally advise that relying on self-disclosure, coupled with any testing that you carry out, should suffice, alongside complying with public health guidance at time to time. Employees may only be entitled to SSP when notified by the government to self-isolate for 14 days, but be aware that reduced pay is likely to discourage people from disclosing that they've received a government notification. Employees required to stay at home due to workplace tracing may be entitled to full pay. Employers should also be aware of their duties under the Reporting of Injuries, Diseases and Dangerous, Dangerous Occurrence Regulations 2013 or RIDDLE. In most industries, a requirement to report is unlikely to be triggered by someone contracting COVID-19 purely due to exposure to a colleague at work, but this should be carefully thought through and may be relevant particularly for those in the healthcare sector. We'd also flag that people need to be aware of the tracing fraud Unfortunately, there is an increasingly prevalent phishing and spearing attacks which seek to use track and trace as an opportunity. Government tracers being posed as by uh, people trying to conduct cybersecurity crimes and requiring employees to click links and provide details. Employees should be warned to be on the lookout for this as well as other COVID themed fraud. So now we're turning our attention to a different but equally pressing threat arriving, arising from COVID-19, which is the prevalence of homeworking and the risks that it brings. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so let's start with um, what targeted monitoring is, because it's one of the solutions being suggested by many, including in the press, uh, to close down the increased insider threat risk when it comes to uh, working from home environments or remote working environments. Monitoring isn't neatly defined in any statute. It typically involves any tool, platform or system that enables an employer to gather or assess data in respect of an employee's activities or communications. Monitoring employees' use of electronic systems is often used by employers in the workplace, but employee monitoring also encompasses physical access logs and CCTV footage of the work workplace, for instance. Very briefly, the legal framework is uh, varied and broad in scope in the UK. So it encompasses uh, the right to privacy under the European Convention on Human Rights, albeit that seems grand, it's fairly well established that employees have a right to privacy in their workplace communications under Article 8. Obviously, it encompasses the General Data Protection Regulation and the Data Protection Act 2018 because it usually involves processing of personal data. It invokes the implied duty of trust and confidence in terms of um, the employment relationship, which means that excessive monitoring can form the basis of a claim for constructive unfair dismissal uh, and targeting could even prompt discrimination type claims. In some cases where there is a degree of live listening or interception of communication, further regulations triggered, but we're not considering that at length today. So how can employers monitor employees? Well, employers can implement monitoring through existing or specialist software tools or devices. A few examples are uh, software that picks up on risk keywords being used in emails and other communications that indicate undesirable conduct. 
capturing access logs for swipe cards and CCTV, preventing employees from accessing inappropriate web content or restricting access to areas such as personal email accounts on work devices, and more generally capturing browsing logs and patterns and access to activities performed on high risk platforms operated by employers like HR databases and customer relationship management platforms. These are fairly standard examples of employee monitoring. Software does exist to uh, implement more invasive means of monitoring, such as um, tools tacking onto mailbox functionality to gauge productivity and capacity, uh, webcam access and capture and keystroke logging. Uh, but as we're going to discuss later, we wouldn't advise using those in most settings. So how is the position different now? Well, broadly, the spread of COVID-19 has further increased the insider threat risk because there's been a spike in opportunistic actors. As Rachel mentioned, phishing attacks have increased by about 35% since the turn of the year. The remote working environment is obviously less secure in some ways. Employees might be working in close proximity to others outside of the organisation and they might be becoming more blasé with that as time goes on. Morale may of course be lower than normal or employees may even feel antipathy towards an employer in connection with, for instance, restructuring decisions, deferred pay reviews or simply frustration at the length of lockdown. And finally, pressure and circumstances. Lots of people are juggling childcare, um, elderly care, uh, as well as uh, technical issues like VPN shutdowns. Um, and that, of course, leads to an extra level of carelessness and more shortcutting, which can include uploading confidential information and documents to unprotected file sharing sites or Gmail accounts, for example. So what should I think about before deploying new monitoring activities to better protect the business during these anything but business as usual times and to counter the insider threat? Well, the starting point should always be, why am I taking this step now? It's a really important question to ask yourself. Some employers might fear the consequences of remote working and might have very good reasons for that. But if there's a reliable solution already in place in terms of hardware, software, access and rules and behavioural expectations, then employers should very carefully consider any increase in the steps they already take, particularly where that involves enhanced monitoring. A few key starting point principles when you're considering perhaps a, a, a type of enhanced monitoring are to think about the alternatives which don't actively invade the employee's home space or private life online. That might include training, for example, on how to spot topical phishing techniques like third parties posing as HMRC in connection with a furloughing or coronavirus job retention scheme application or internal managers and also importantly training on how to deal with them. Managing, using existing relationships to make sure line managers are checking at least checking regularly with their reports and ensuring that they are coping and dealing with particular pressures or challenges. Policies, of course, it's important to ensure existing policies that deal with information security standards and employee behaviour and performance work in a remote sense. But there may be a case for adding policies if you don't already have them, like bring your own device policies and remote working policies. Taking proactive measures are always preferable to targeted monitoring. At a really basic level, blocking beats capturing an evidence chain when it comes to monitoring of employees. So for example, having blocking tools to prevent harmful or banned content, like access to Gmail or Hotmail through employer systems, is always better than creating and reviewing uh, a log of such act access. Moving on then, if you are proposing to rule out new monitoring tools, TRAP should be your starting point. If you properly consider and deal with each of those issues, you'll be in much better shape when it comes to compliance. Very briefly, they are transparency. Have you been absolutely clear with staff that you might undertake certain monitoring activities and that those circumstances that you're in include the circumstances described in policies and notices, etc.? Secondly, reasons. Why do you want to do what you intend to do? That fundamentally impacts whether you're able to do it or not and have a lawful basis for what you intend to do. Some reasons will obviously carry less weight than others. So checking up that someone was at their desk at a particular point in time uh, isn't a particularly compelling reason, for instance. Thirdly, accountability. 
in relation to both data protection challenges and employment tribunal challenges, the evidence trail relating to why you took particular decisions will be absolutely vital to whether or not some negative finding might be made. Fourthly, proportionality. Perhaps the most important principle here, considering the reasons or purposes for your proposed monitoring, it's really important to consider and evidence both that the particular tool or activity was the most appropriate and least invasive, and that the way that you configured it or applied it was also the least invasive way possible. It's sometimes better to illustrate the monitoring standards through an example, so I'll give you a quick one. If you're alerted to a suspicion that a certain employee is not at their working from home station when they say they are, or should be, then it's very unlikely to be proportionate for a line manager or member of HR to access their emails, to troll calendars and send or received items. Instead, the employee might properly be asked questions outright to identify whether or not that was the case and whether there are circumstances or pressures that the employer ought to be aware of. Hopefully that gives a good um, practical overlay. I see that a number of questions have been coming in as we speak. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rachel uh, to see if we can draw some of those out and get some answers. Absolutely, thanks David. So one of the first ones we've got in is what use, if any, is an attestation from employees that they do not have COVID symptoms? Good question. I think a really good starting point and um, in theory it ought to be um, very useful indeed. As we said briefly, public health guidance in England, and I think this is reflected in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland too, is that employees should self-certify, they should be required to tell us and we should be able to rely on it. So um, there is a, 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 a high degree of reliability, at least in the guidance. Employers will have to look critically at um, whether that's uh, reliable in practice, but that should be the starting point always. Brilliant, and we've got another one here. If you take a register of who's in the office for the purpose of tracing and only allow people to enter the office if they do not have a temperature, does that amount to recording special category data? Interesting, that's a really good question. Um, I should say that it, it depends on precisely what activities are being undertaken. The starting point perhaps might be that there's no processing of data, at least such that might be captured by GDPR, if nothing is recorded uh, in systems or in a manual recording system. But of course, you will in fact be acting upon those decisions and there will probably be an element of processing. For instance, when you follow up with an employee who's been told to self-isolate because they have a feverish temperature. So it's nice, it's attractive to assume that no processing is occurring, um, but it's not always practical and employers need to be really critically look at that. I wonder if that might be all we have time for before 1.30, Rachel? I think it is. So if your question wasn't answered, then we'll reach out to you shortly and answer it directly. Or if you think of anything later, please feel free to reach out. Our details are set out on the slide. Thank you all for tuning in and please join us at 1pm next Tuesday for Immigration and COVID-19 Challenges.